Hi, everybody. This is Bhagya Jamie Marich, joined by Satyavani Gayatri for this special edition of Tea and Take, or in my case, Tea and Golden Milk, which... I have sweet orange this morning with my very appropriate Bigfoot cup. Very good. I'm a, very good. I'm a Bigfoot gal, so... So, my sister, there's been a lot going on in the last couple of weeks. Oh, indeed. indeed. Um, I feel like I may have some unburdening to do, and we've had some interesting dialogue online. So, how have you been doing? You know, this has been a very difficult few weeks. And um, with the new paradigm shift for women. Yeah. Um, and the thing that I've been contemplating in my mind is the, the relationship between being a woman in the material Western world mm -hmm. and being a deep spiritual practitioner. And that in and of itself has been, um, very challenging, um, there were days where I just, I wanted to slam the computer lid down and, and watching the Kavanaugh hearings. Um, and, and then, then taking time to take a step back and say, well, you know, this is the material plane. You know, I, I am not the body. I am the soul. Yeah. And wrestling with the, quote, reality of the material world that, that I live in and feeling like the country is going back 50, 60 years mm -hmm. um, and, and having it um, condone. And I think that the, the difficult part of the, the condoning piece of it not just from a male perspective. And I want to be clear, I don't think that, I'm not a man hater. I don't think that all men are, you know, awful or, you know, in that same category. I mean, my own husband is very, like, this is just outrageous. But he also defers to the spiritual plane as well and says, okay, you know, this is what's playing itself out right now um, for the karma of the United States. Um, but balancing that with, okay, how as a woman do I, do I rise? How do I, how do I rise with my sisters? Um, and, and also being equally frustrated with women who are yes. supporting, you know, this kind of movement. And, and it's interesting just having observed, I mean, I will say, with the exception of a couple of people in my sphere, I don't really have that, that issue, but just observing some of the television clips of women getting interviewed and saying, Oh, you know, boys will be boys, et cetera, et cetera. High school. Right. And it's like, this just, this just isn't okay. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm trying to figure out where does that space my spiritual practices Mm -hmm. to empower my feminine divine and understanding that this is a temporary situation um, in, you know, it's a, a blip in time, no matter how frustrating of a blip in time um, it is, but also empower activism right. to move women forward in a very activist kind of way and not necessarily in the traditional way. I mean, I'm, I'm all about, I'm going to go to the Women's March. I've been to every Women's March in, um, that Boise um, has put on. Mm -hmm. and, and it's also interesting being here um, in Boise, Idaho. Um, you know, Boise being one of the most conservative states in the union, if not the most conservative state in the union. Now, Boise is a little bit different um, in that it, you know, it has you know, pockets of, of progressive, um, progressive thought. And the Women's March here, I've gone to every single one of them, and I will be going to the one in January, et cetera. But how do we approach it this time from a different perspective? Yeah. You know, not just being signs waving, and, and those things are important, but also what, what are some of the, the mobilizations? And I have to say, I am very impressed um, in, in my own state with the amount of women who are stepping forward. I mean, we have a, um, a woman 
who is running for governor right now, um, a Native American woman who's running for governor. Um, and that's very impressive. And a lot of women in my sphere um, here in Boise are very, very active. And so that's very impressive. So the, the upshot to all of this is, is that women are pushing their voice and out. Um, but I am frustrated, especially when I get um, magazine covers like the New Yorker, you know, that are like this, which is a very telling thing. Right. And I look at that and I equally want to tear the cover and, and equally cry. Right. So I'm interested in, in your thoughts. I, let me start with talking about a new kind of activism, because this is something I feel very passionately about. And then I'll certainly get into how the last few weeks have affected me. Mm -hmm. um, yes, it's more than marches. It's more than waving signs. It's more than tirades on Facebook. Uh, I think the biggest way we can revolt and bring about change is to be unapologetically, unabashedly ourselves in our workspaces and our home spaces and our public spaces and lean into our spiritual practices and support when we get blowback from that. Um, like this weekend in the scope of everything happening, I had the great pleasure of presenting at a major international conference that I've gone to before uh, many times. And it's in the EMDR community where I, I have, you know, pretty well known. And I just remember reflecting on how 11 years ago when I first started going to that conference feeling like a scared little girl. Mm -hmm. And just this weekend resting into this experience of being unapologetically myself, sharing my work, being willing to have difficult conversations and showing other younger women that there's a different way to be in the world. And also speaking on the women's marches, I remember in 2017, at the beginning of 2017, when the first march happened after the inauguration, um, I had a couple interesting decisions to make because I had come off a big stint on the road, was going on to another one, and I had two days <laughs> kind of in between. And one of them was the day of the march, and one of them was the day that I had a sexual empowerment with yoga and dance workshop scheduled with a friend of mine. It was the first one that we had put out there for women. And I had to make some choices on where I spent my energy that weekend. And marches and real public rallies energetically, it, it's, it's just not my jam. As much as I could see myself being in a march at some point, if, if it called for it. Um, and I felt how I was really bringing about change that weekend was being fully present and a role model and an example to do this workshop. Wonderful. And to hopefully empower other women to, to carry this message of you can you can be yourself, you can speak your your power, um, and that power comes from a place of a greater truth, which is, and we'll get to that sure, I'm I'm sure <laughs> on this call as spiritual people. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that's part of my answer for for the new kind of activism. That it um I really love that because I'm yeah. also um, right now, I'm in the process of developing um, a, a, a program that is about 18 months um, mm -hmm. on the divine Ayurvedic woman. Love it. Mm -hmm. And looking at empowerment practices, you know, first starting with foundation, then moving into personal ritual, mm -hmm. and then outward activism. Mm -hmm. based on that personal ritual. And so um, I, I'm, I'm, right, I'm right in line with you. So I, I appreciate that. And I think you can be outspoken. So I'm, I'm not necessarily criticizing people who just do the Facebook rants. Um, but I, I often wonder, is that either what's behind it? You know, are you willing to put some further action into that? You know, I often hear a lot of anger and pain, which is justified. In, in those in those rants, but then I wonder, does it help you getting it out there, or does it stir more of the resentment? Um, so you know, so much I could say on that, but I, I'll just say about being outspoken. I, I think you can still be outspoken and speak your voice, but in a way that I, I, I guess I'll, I'll just speak personally here. A couple of weeks ago, I had a piece come out called "Confessions of a Recovering Pro-Lifer." And it speaks to what we're talking about here with this new activism, plus my feelings on what's happening this week, that or what has happened in these recent weeks with, with Brett Kavanaugh and everything. And 
uh, I'll share the piece. I'll link it to this to this page because it shows a lot of where I have come from, knowing how a lot of these conservative cultures think, uh, not just about women, uh, but about life and morals and life and the perspective. And having come from that, I am completely not surprised by what no, went down. No, 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 no. I, 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 to that end. Yeah. Absolutely, Prague. I was not surprised at all. I think what, I won't say what surprised me, but what was very frustrating for me was Senator Collins. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I, at just on the sheer level of being a female, and, and I will say, you know, I've been sexually assaulted mm -hmm. and abused. Yep. And um, the, the idea of people not understanding why, in this case, a woman would, you know, because this obviously happens to men as well, mm -hmm. um, but as a woman, why you would not come forward immediately, mm -hmm. um, why you would keep it inside for, you know, 20, 25, 30 years. Um, and I will say that in my particular situation, I didn't say anything for close to 20 years. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it happened as a young person and then um, didn't come out until, um, until my um, latter portion of my 20s. Mm -hmm. And what's fascinating to me is for folks to say, oh, well, you know, you were a child and you can understand why you were pressed it, et cetera, et cetera. Well, how is that different right. in this situation? You know, I, I'm, I'm trying to understand that. And the thing that's so interesting is also somebody like um, Senator Collins, who, you know, behind the scenes, we know what was going on, you know, I mean, whether she was, you know, bought off, whether it was, um, she has a huge donor who was saying, if you don't vote this way, you're going to lose your funding. You know, I mean, like all of that kind of stuff. I mean, that's, that's politics, mm -hmm. but to, to voraciously advocate for somebody who clearly demonstrated, I mean, just take out the, the, the sexual assault piece of it, who clearly demonstrated that there was no control of self yeah <laughs> i mean you know people are like well is he an alcoholic is he not an alcoholic mm -hmm. put that aside he's a rageaholic yeah and do we want and, that at a judiciary position exactly and the thing I was <laughs> right i mean I, I absolutely i don't i mean and this is the thing like you know, everybody talks about oh well you know you're ruining his life to the, ruining his life okay right. So let, let's think about that. What is the worst thing that could ha have happened? He would have gone back to being a federal judge. Right. I mean, like, how, is that, how is that ruining his life? Mm -hmm. um, but aside from that, like the, the shock and the awe from another woman defending the situation mm -hmm. um, to a very high degree, you know, right. to, you know, justifying it page after page after page. And what that, you know, clicked for me was, wow, you know, there are definitely women out there that I do as a, you know, and that's fine. I, I get that. I'm not asking everybody to see the world the same way that I do, but like, wow, you know, there, there is such an embedded yeah. paradigm. It's, it's, a, it's a cultural trauma-based cognition. Because something we talk about, at least in the EMDR perspective on trauma, are these negative cognitions, these negative core beliefs that we acquire at a very visceral limbic level that we can't rationalize away because they're so, you, know, you used a great word, embedded, uh, yeah. implicit. It's DNA. It's DNA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Literally. And I think so many of us have acquired this negative cognition that I am inferior. Um, well, and, and to that end, there's also this cognition that, you know, and I, and I, it's so funny. We talk about the concept of truth, you know, right. and in speaking of truth, you know, hey, um, but how seriously profound the idea that 
the paradigm that, quote, we were raised with could actually be false. Right. And that is traumatizing for people. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think of it, it's not, it's not necessarily a gender specific and only issue as it relates to the Kavanaugh hearings, but rather these deep seated beliefs, you know, the idea that, you know, the, the American dream, you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps and white is better than everything else. And, and, you know, men are the ones who make the decisions and, and women, you know, have certain roles, et cetera. Like those deep embedded birth beliefs that if we actually sat down and thought about it, oh my God, if that's not right, then, you know, then what's reality for me? Mm -hmm. Because I was raised to believe it. And that comes with the idea of control. You know, people are raised to think that they have control over their lives and their destiny and that everything in the material world is, is their thing. And that if they, if they don't succeed, it's their personal failure. It has nothing to do with the structure in which, you know, things are laid. And the reality is, is that once you realize you have no control, the better off you are. Mm -hmm. And so this, these are issues of here is a paradigm that I was raised to believe. And that helped me feel secure. Mm -hmm. And now all of a sudden, you know, women in this case are starting to unravel that. It's like, Oh no, 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 no. That's, that's scary. That's scary. And what that comes down to is people can't handle. Yeah. It's scary. It's taken me personally 19 years to slowly unravel it at different degrees because uh, it is so embedded. And a little bit of uh, perspectival reflection that I have on this because it's, you know, the midterm elections are coming up next month. It's two years. Half about it yesterday. Two years since D Day, you know, and, and everything that, that went down there. And um, so I'm, you know, I'm a survivor of, of multiple sexual spiritual traumas in both childhood and adulthood. Um, I've come forward to the people I've needed to come forward to in terms of uh, personal confrontations or um, my therapists and my friends. But like one of the reasons I never went to law enforcement is I don't want to put myself through this. It's just my choice in this matter. And I feel that there has been a way to heal coming forward to who I need to come forward to. And is that might that change at some point? I don't know. Um, but I, I think one of the things that infuriated me the most in all of this is when uh, 45 put that tweet out there saying, oh, this was as bad as she said it was. Certainly she would have gone to, to law enforcement. And I mean, that's just either a level of ignorance or a level of beating in the script that because I've gotten in arguments with family members, even it's, it's, at the advent of Me Too, when you know they, they've said things like, you know, why is everybody coming out of the woodwork now? And oh, that just that I hate that fucking phrase, the woodwork, um, because it, it's you know just so much I could say from from a trauma perspective on all of this. I'm sorry, you're trying to get something in, and then I want to talk about two years now. No, I, I appreciate it. It's just what, what you said triggered something for me. It was interesting. I was. Um, I was watching um, a clip from Trevor Noah, who does oh, the daily. Love him. <laughs> love him. He's hilarious. But he did a very, you know, somewhat serious piece on the, um, for lack of a better word, the, the powerful ability that Trump has in the space of victimhood. Yeah. And how he and his band of conservative characters have had the ability to take a situation where in this case, you know, Dr. Ford is the victim and turn it around to make it that Kavanaugh was the victim. Mm -hmm. So like this concept that you're saying like, Oh, why is everybody coming out of the woodwork with the me too piece of it? It's like, well, a, um, it's been going on for a really long time. And finally people are saying something about it. But also this, this idea that, oh, you know, I, well, now every man is going to be accused of sexual assault, et cetera, et cetera. And, and Trevor said something really interesting. He says, you know, uh, what are you talking about? Like right now, since the Me Too movement, you're talking about like, you know, maybe 120 guys uh-huh. have been, you know, accused where it's probably 50 times more women who have been assaulted 
you know? And so like, you know, what are we talking about here? Yeah. So, but, but the ability for Trump and McConnell and, um, uh, Lindsey Graham to make it, to turn it around that like, oh, you know, it's not safe as Trump said, it's not safe to be a man anymore. What, what is it like to be an African American man? And that's a common gaslighting technique. It, totally. It's a common totally. gaslighting technique. And this is what power structures do when people challenge the status quo that has served them for so long. So exactly. that's kind of why I'm like, I'm just, I'm just not surprised. And now, oh. What I'm trying to unpack with a, with a lot of my reactions and responses to this is from this place of I'm not surprised, I, I'm trying to figure out if I'm either totally chill or I'm totally numb about all of this. Like, you know, this is America's karmic path and we're cleansing the way we're, we're supposed to be. And what's going to happen is going to happen. And all I can really change is myself and my internal world and choose to be a voice for women, a voice that, that advocates for myself bucking this status quo. And it does feel more chill than numb. Um, and, but I think any vestiges of numbness that are there, which I am unpacking with my therapist, can kind of come from, I mean, that's how I survived all these years. It's not going to change. Or I'm not surprised by what's going down here. So, I mean, some of the feelings were so noxious that numbness is not like the better option and, and I'm not feeling a lot of numbness it's more like you know we got a lot of we got a lot of work to do um but I do believe there there is some this is some greater purging that's happening it may get worse before it gets better absolutely um, so I, I my my side of it and I, it's great to have this conversation with you Pragya because um your chill side what you know this is the this is the as a lot of people who know me well um the stereotypical satyavani feels a fire where like i i'm like mm -hmm. okay i'm gonna start burning things down you know <laughs> but what's been interesting is um i i feel i i feel it physically mm -hmm. i feel it in you know when we're talking about tapping into the spiritual side of this, I feel it um, very physically, viscerally in my root chakra, in my sacral chakra, um, and in my um, heart chakra. Mm -hmm. Very much where there is this aching. Yeah. And, you know, it, and, and actually physically painful. The past couple of days, I've, I've had some very challenging back issues and, um, and, and hip issues, et cetera. And what I'm, I'm feeling to that end is there's something stirring, right? There's, there is, there is an ugly, there is a fire that's, that's coming. And how am I going to channel that? Right. And, and then, yeah, yeah, what you described is something I strongly relate to two years ago when 45 was elected in the aftermath of a lot of that. And I mean, it was a combination of shock, horror, rage, and terror inside of me by, by what I saw things happen. And the way I saw certain loved ones and family members rise to defend that behavior is what was the biggest trigger of all this. That got me back into serious therapy. Because in addition to some other shifts I was going through in my, my life at that point, plus all of that that came out in the public forum and just being reminded that I'm really not safe as a woman because on the political, if I could just go for, for a brief moment, I've never been the biggest Hillary Clinton fan, but to see how an educated woman was vilified and this that we have now was preferred over all of that. Um, it, 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 it just really affirmed this idea that I'm not safe as a woman with a lot of people in my family, with a lot of people in, in the general public. And it helped me to relish those people in my community who I am safe with. Right. And, you know, something we work on a lot with trauma survivors is this negative core belief, talking about negative core beliefs, that I am not safe. Right. And for me, that's often finessed as I'm not safe as a woman. And something that we do in EMDR, for instance, is to try to process the emotion behind that and get people to shift the thinking. And as a client, I've never been able to come to a place of I'm safe. Because are we ever really because of 100% of the time because of the way the world works, especially as a woman, but a cognitive in the material world, yeah, yeah. In the material world. Yes. But what I was able to come to is I am safe within myself. 
and that connection with source and that in this in this material world i can choose my pockets of safety i have people i am safe with i have moments where i am safe and i need to really lean into those when this kind of larger macro construct is is shifting in a way that can make me feel very unsafe right now so it was interesting because around the time of the election, there was a piece circulating the interwebs that's, that's, uh, that was titled Donald Trump as spiritual teacher. And I first wanted to gag when I saw the title of the article, but then I really got the point of it because yes, yes. Answering the challenge yes. to the stuff that that rose up has yes. ushered in probably two of the biggest years of healing in my life. Absolutely. I had an individual I was working with this week where the Kavanaugh stuff stirred some stuff. And even at, at the end of our time together, it was like, I guess this is like a Brett Kavanaugh spiritual teacher. Absolutely. <laughs> and and that, that's a very, I completely and utterly understand that. Um, one of my teachers, um, Devarshi, yeah. you know, he, he actually put that out there in, um, in a private uh, group with my Acharya family mm -hmm. about how, you know, this is, this is the work. This is the work, you know, and, and a friend of mine who lives in New York, um, Stephanie, she, you know, was saying to me, she's like, you know, she, she lives in New York. It's a blue state. A lot of people are enraged. You know, that she was a big Bernie supporter. Um, she's like, but in some ways it's easy to be in the echo chamber. Yeah. Whereas, you know, when, for example, me being in Idaho, you know, where the most healing and most transformation, um, in my opinion, needs to happen, this is, this is where the spiritual rubber meets the road. Mm -hmm. And so how do you work with that? And, I, and what I'm discovering for myself is I have to do the internal work. Mm -hmm. And then I can do the external work and, and the two play with each other. You know, it's, you know, there's going to be days where it's like, wow, you know, I, I'm not going outside today because <laughs> it's a little difficult, but then there are other days where it's like, okay, yeah, you know, I want to, I want to bring these practices. Um, and the best way that we can do that is to, is to take care of ourselves um, and not, you know, let's take care of ourselves and drink a ton of alcohol and, you know, do all of these practices, right. Mm -hmm. But rather, you know, what is, what is from an Ayurvedic perspective, what is your Dinacharya and right. how can that Dinacharya become that daily routine, become that path. And so sadhana and japa and, um, spiritual readings, which are actually very helpful because they shine light on the fact like, yeah, you know, this is the material plane and this is what's going to happen, but you are not the body. You are the spirit, spirit soul. And, and how do I use that as a woman to empower my clients, empower the, um, the community around me, um, and even family members, if they're even not interested in listening. Ditto to all of that. And then if you have the capacity, the access to really good trauma-focused therapy, something like EMDR, somatic experiencing, yes. even expressive arts therapy, gestalt work, something that can help you. Meditation and motion. Meditation and motion. Because this will bring up stuff, and then the challenge becomes, what do I do with it? And that's part of what I was getting at with some of like, I, I'm not necessarily opposed to being outspoken or ranting, but it's like, what are you, where's it going? Where's it flowing? Is it circling like a hamster wheel and keeping you in this tunnel of rage? Because if it is, respond to that call, do the deep digging, do the work. And if you can't access professional therapy, go to friends or people in your support network who are good at validating, but then challenging. Absolutely. Who are good at asking questions like, what is this really about? I agree. And what's the healing that, that needs to happen here? And I want to be careful to never say that from a place of blaming victims. Like, you know, you got to. Oh, no, 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 no. But I totally why I want to speak to that is because, you know, we are in this spiritual path where so much of the teaching is it, it's inside of you. It's your reactive perceptions that are causing this, which it's a, to me, it's a double edged sword because on one hand, I agree with that. Yep. Yet on the other hand, I think some teachers can use that teaching almost abusively where it can take an invalidating tone. 
Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. It happened to you, but now it's a reactive perception and it's up to you to do the work on it. And, and it's a both and. And anybody who's followed my teaching for quite some time knows that my first recovery sponsor, the woman who saved my life, the piece of direction she gave that saved my life was after everything that happened to you, it's no wonder you're having these responses. It's no wonder you're having these reactions. Let's validate them and, and move on. plan of action. Not even move on, because I think move on is an ultimate goal. But it, right. what are we going to do with it? What's right. the plan? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, well, Guru Dev talks about that a lot. You know, he talks about that what it is that we're feeling are reactive responses to past experiences and traumas. Mm -hmm. And the only time we experience true joy is in the present moment mm -hmm. versus ruminating on the past or projecting into the future. And so I would just say the present moment at this time has called me to vote. And I filled out my absentee ballot mm -hmm. and I mailed it off a couple days ago. And that's what I can do in this present moment along with my, my spiritual dinacharya. So, And one thing I, I want to affirm just even further to survivors who may be listening to this, who are on a spiritual or yogic path and meditative path and get talked to a lot about the present moment, the present moment. It's always both and to me because I agree with so much of this. Yet so much of how unhealed trauma can metabolize in the limbic brain what happened to you 50 years ago can feel like today. Absolutely. So be kind to yourself if you don't feel you can release those reactive perceptions. And if patience. You, yeah, and can't live in the present moment. Um, that, but then I go to what's the plan? How can you care for yourself and see what, what most needs to be done to move forward? Um, so this was a great talk. You're awesome. I'm so glad we had this discussion. I think it's relevant. Yeah. And, um, and I would say to anybody who's listening that if you are looking for tools in the Ohio area or in the Boise area or even at a distance, mm -hmm. both Pragya and I are, are here to yeah. assist in that process um, on the way of, of the spiritual path because they are powerful tools and they really do help in, in situations and in times like this and on that token i wanted to shout out my resources website which is traumamadesimple.com that's the one-stop shopping for all of the videos that i've done all the articles that i've done that you can access completely free since i'm often not in ohio i feel obliged to put that out there absolutely, absolutely. i will i will shout out yeah. zenspotmbs.com um book an appointment come in for some spiritual uh, counseling or some Ayurvedic healing and uh, you know we're here for you as well. So. Very good well thank you for joining us for this special edition of Tea and Take. We'll take. Golden Milk and Take. So happy you introduced me to this magical beverage. Jai Bhagwan. Jai Bhagwan. Namaste everyone. Okay.